everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Um, we're going to just give it one minute for everybody to log in. We have a, uh, a ton of people registered today for today's very special FDP collaboration webinar. And so uh, as soon as it hits 3.02 Eastern time, I'm going to start it. since right now it says 301. And we already did get one question. Yes, this recording is going to be shared. The slides are gonna be shared. I'm gonna go over that in just one moment. All right. It is now exactly 3.02. Uh, I could see that there's still people logging in. We have over 500 in the room. Uh, and so we're ready to get started. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. You are uh, attending uh, a special hosted um, webinar from the Federal Demonstration Partnership titled Strategies for Assessing Efforts in Preparing NIH Institutional Training Grants, Insights from the Federal Demonstration Partnership, uh, NIH, the NIH Biomedical Research Workforce, and the National Training Grant Community of Practice. Yes, that's a very long title. Uh, my name is Stephanie Scott. I am from Columbia University, and I am an uh, FDP administrative representative from Columbia University. And we're going to talk a little bit um, once we go through the presentations of what that exactly means, especially for those of you who might not be familiar with the FDP. I'm going to turn it over just for a second to Sarah Peterzak, um, who is the Senior Program Assistant for the FDP, to go over just a couple of housekeeping rules. Hello, everybody. Um, so if you experience any issues with Zoom, you can call 1-888-799-9666 and choose option two. Your audio will be streamed for your speakers. Um, you can message the hosts in the chat. Someone just said we can't hear. Can you not hear me? I hear you. Oh. They may, they may need to Zoom technical support. <laughs> your, your speaker is real low, uh, Sarah. Oh, oh like, so it's one of those. Okay. If, if, if you're having trouble hearing her, I'll just repeat. Um, if you're having technical support, you could call the 1-800 number on your screen, uh, the audio stream through your speakers. Um, and uh, if you are a member of the press, please use the chat to give us your name and the publication of which you're with. And everyone can hear me now, right? Okay, great. Yes, you can hear me. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, with regards to Q&A, we actually received a lot of questions prior um, at, upon your registration ahead of time. And we're going to be prioritizing those um, and going over those. Uh, however, please do use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. All of the questions are going to be submitted to the panelists, which we're going to use to help us prioritize our future discussion our future discussions and possibly some future FAQs. Uh, yes, these slides and a recording will be shared with you. Everything is going to be posted on the FDP website and there is the URL, it's thefdp.org. And if you go to miss listening, I'm sorry, meetings and listening sessions, past events, you will find it there, but we will send everything out. You will not miss it, don't you worry. Okay, um, so let me introduce today's presenters. Uh, on the FDP side of things, we have Robert Novels, uh, Vice President of Research Administration of Emory University, who is an FDP faculty representative. Uh, and I'm with Columbia University. I'm the Director of Policy and Research Development, and I am an FDP administrative representative. 
And our special guests today are uh, from the National Training Grant Community of Practice. We have Liz Stein, who is the chair of the NTG COP uh, and director of graduate and postdoc uh, professional development and training at Northwestern University. And we also have Kelly Moore, the vice chair of the NTG COP and director of the training grant support office for Emory University. And finally, um, uh, our very special guest star from NIH today is Erica Boone, director of the Division of Biomedical Research Workforce in the NIH Office of Extramural Research. And I want to thank all of our presenters today for taking the time to uh, be part of this webinar. So let me tell you exactly what we're going to be going over today. Um, I know that there may be many people in the audience that have never attended an FDP meeting before. And so we're going to talk about what the FDP is and what we do. We're then going to talk about what the ND NTG COP is. Um, and then we're going to have Erica talk about the upcoming changes impacting NIH training grant proposals, uh, which take effect for proposals being submitted on or after January 25th. 2025. We're then going to end it off with our Q&A discussion and next steps. And so we are going to launch one poll first, which is we would like to know what your level of experience is with training grants, either in preparing a proposal or managing award. And so there is your poll right now. And you guys are very quick in answering the question. And so I'm just going to give it a couple of more seconds. Okay, I think um, I think we could stop it here, and we could share the results. Great. And so 29% um, of you are very experienced. A little over 40% of you have some experience. 21% a little experience, or you've seldom been involved in it. And about 9% have never had experience in working with an NIH training grant. Thank you. This is very helpful for us as we continue um, going on with the presentation. So I'm going to stop sharing that. And I'm going to move on. All right. So we're going to kick it off. Robert, very excited to have you kick off to talk a little bit about the FDP and what we do. Yeah, happy to provide that information. So so walking through this, and I'm just very excited that we have this topic and, and really organize the community in this way to have over 650 individuals joining us so far this afternoon. But, but let me walk you through Federal Demonstration Partnership uh, really, really quickly. Uh, the mission is to streamline the administration of federal sponsored research and fostering collaboration. I will tell you, we meet triannually and we really spend a concerted amount of time working with our federal partners. Uh, working with multiple institutions, I'll give you a little information about that, but really diving into finding out ways to reduce administrative burden for both our faculty and administrators. And, and it is a cooperative initiative, part of the National Academies. Uh, and so we, we, we tie in uh, to our re research ecosystem uh, very well. Next slide. Oops, sorry. There we go. And so uh, just a bit about FDP, uh, there is a foundation, which is the legal entity we convene three times a year. Uh, prior to COVID, it, they were all in person. Now we have uh, one in person, two online. Uh, the reason to provide you this information for background is that there will be an open period of time, which would allow for non-FDP uh, member organizations to apply to become an FDP member, which with a commitment that you will streamline administrative burdens at your institution and contribute to the national conversation. Um, and so we we have committees and subcommittees and working groups and demonstrations. We do a lot. Uh, next slide. Wait, so they say they can't see the slides. The audience says they they cannot see our slides. That oh, might be a some new, new Zoom issue. They might need to, on the top banner, they have to click on the, the tab that says Stephanie Scott's screen and make sure they are on that and not on the tab that says webinar. We've had this okay. come up a couple of times in the latest Zoom update. Oh, that's awesome. All right. So I didn't know that. Thank you. So please... so, but you guys could see my slides, right? Uh, uh, many people can, some can't. So 
uh, Aaron and team that cannot see it, click on uh, the screen that you can see, which is Stephanie Scott's screen. She is she is navigating that for us today. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. So I'm going to move on and I hope everyone can see them and I'll look for Aaron to say, yes, she verified or him, her, whoever it is. All right. So we, we have a leadership team. We have a new executive director with Maria uh, and we have two elected uh, co-chairs, one representing the faculty, one representing research administration and Michelle and Alex. Um, wonderful partners uh, and uh, part of organizational structure, but there's there's more. Next slide. Uh, we have 217 institutions. Uh, uh, one fifth is emerging research institutions. 15% are minority serving institutions. We work directly with the federal government. Um, and you can see the names of the organizations. They provide presentations. Uh, on the triennial basis, providing uh, structural updates. You've met Sarah already. And uh, it's important to note that Michelle Bulls, uh, we basically call her the Dean of the federal uh, entities. Uh, she works with us as the lead federal representative and um, is such a joy and, and down to earth individual that we've worked through a number of the policies and procedures with. Next slide. Uh, and so a bit of history, uh, Federal Demonstration Partnership used to be the Florida Demonstration Project back in 1986. I wasn't around doing this work at that point, but but nevertheless, it progressed through a series of phases over time. And, and now we're on a cycle of about every six to seven years, starting a new phase. Um, we in integrated evaluation activity. We've done a number of things that I think that you as an audience uh, uh, take advantage of. One of the primary activities, we have a clearinghouse, which is an administrative process. Uh, we, we've done things related to conflict of interest. Uh, we have launched the faculty workload survey uh, three times we're going on our fourth and uh, we measure administrative burden as we go through uh, the process of trying to reduce burdens across the landscape. And I'll tell you, there's been a lot of work done and a lot of advancements made in partnership with the federal government. Um, and, and so some questions that we get sometimes, is how do you measure prevention? Meaning if we weren't doing this, how much extra work would there be? Um, I would tell you just through practice, it would be significant. And so there's a, there's a very close partnership. And that's why I'm really glad that we're partnering on this training grant initiative as well. Next slide. Great. I'm going to take over from here, Robert, to talk a little bit about what the D and FDP is. What is a demonstration exactly? And so it can include five different types of activities. Uh, it could be an exploratory initiative, a study, or white paper development. It can be a tool or a guidance document, a survey, a pilot project, and we have several ongoing projects um, or tools that we have developed that we continually monitor and tweak. And so it starts with an emerging topic or an idea where within the FDP, we formally submit a proposal, which is approved by the executive committee. A working group is typically formed of member institutions, uh, all volunteers, by the way, uh, and then um, the activity is launched and monitored. And so just to give you a very quick snapshot of some of the things that we're currently working on, many of which, uh, as Robert mentioned, you probably take advantage of now. Uh, we're currently having a partnership with NIH on the NIH data management and sharing Pilots policy. So there is a pilot currently going on, testing out different types of DMS templates, uh, all with the goal of reducing time for individuals in putting together those plans. Um, we're probably famous for our FDP subaward templates. FDP members, as well as non-members, use those templates on a day-to-day -day basis, which help uh, reduce the amount of time in negotiating subawards. Uh, and of course, we have the FDP Expanded Clearinghouse, which is also related to obtaining subaward information. And I know many of you have heard of Science CV. Science CV is an initiative that started over a decade ago uh, when faculty members brought up the idea, hey, is there a way to streamline the creation of biosketches? And in working with NIA, that's where the initial iteration of Science CV was born. And so um, I highly encourage you to stay informed of FDP activities. We have several listservs. If you um, 
are an FDP member, you can join any of our listservs. If you're not a member, um, you, there is also a special listserv called FDP Friends where you can stay up to date on our activities. And so if you're not sure if you're from a member institution or not, all the member institutions are listed on our website if you go to the FDP.org organization and membership. And um, so as we transition into talking about NIH training grants, um, and uh, Dr. Boone will be talking that, about that very soon, they have a dedicated NIH webpage um, where they've been posting all the cha upcoming changes for January 2025. And this is an area that the FDP has not explored before. Uh, and so we took this meeting on uh, and are exploring if there are opportunities to explore different aspects of these types of grants that can cause administrative burden. I am now, um, oh, and here are our contacts. We have a main email box, fdp at nas.edu. Maria Kazelka, our executive director. Sarah, whom you met, our senior program assistant. And then you could certainly uh, talk to either Robert or I today. Um, you can email us about this particular particular initiative and this webinar. Um, and as I said, you know, every inst every member institution has a, uh, a an FDP faculty representative, an administrative representative, and a technical representative. And if you don't know, if you're from a member institution and you don't know who your uh, FDP rep is, um, you can contact Sarah, and she would be more than happy to let you know. And so I'm going to turn it over now to Liz and Kelly to talk about NTG COP. Excellent. Thank you, Stephanie. Next slide. So my name is Liz Stein. I'm the Director of Graduate and Postdoctoral Professional Development and Training in the Graduate School at Northwestern, where I oversee our Graduate Professional Development, our Office of Postdoctoral Affairs, and our Training Grant Support Office. But I'm here today in my capacity as chair and one of the founding members of the National Training Grant Community of Practice. And so um, the NTG COP, as we like to call it, was founded in 2021 by the people that are currently on the leadership committee on your screen. So individuals from Northwestern, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Emory University, and Georgetown University. Um, and we initially put this um, or brought this community together um, from people that are overseeing centralized training grant support offices. We wanted to come together, share best practices, you know, form a community. I think our first meeting had about 20 or 30 people back in 2021. But quickly after that, we started gaining a lot of momentum and individuals were asking us to please, could they be a part of our community? Could they come to our meetings? They wanted to find a place for support for training grants. And so we quickly opened it up to anyone who is working on training grants in any capacity. So we still have individuals from centralized training grant offices. We have individuals who are working on one or multiple grants in their departments or schools. Anyone that would like to be a part of the organization that works on training grants is absolutely welcome. Um, and these are brand new numbers that we just run, uh, but we have now over 460 members from over 107 institutions. So you can see that there really was a demand for a place um, for people to have a community for those that are working on training grants at their institutions. Next slide. And so we have four goals for this community um, that you can see on the screen. The first is the sharing of information. So this is not just sharing information, say, from the NIH or from different conferences and other places that we're going as part of the community, but also sharing information among the membership as well. We often like to put out surveys that have to do with support structures for your training grants. Um, at your institutions or ways that you collect data for the tables and their pros and cons. We will um, get the answers back from our entire community. We'll collate them together and then we'll send them out for the good of the community to look at. 
Um, the other, another goal is the interpretation of NIH data. Um, you know, a good example is we have all of these changes that are coming out to the training grants from the NIH. And so we'll be talking about those at our upcoming meetings and, and how we interpret them and how we're going to be kind of um, uh, doing those at our various institutions. I think one of the most important things that we do is building community. We have a place for people to ask questions. We have a place for people to talk to each other, meet and network, um, and just kind of uh, discuss and interact with people that have a similar position in their institutions as we do. Um, and then the last is best practices. Again, we have a lot of discussions from tables to policies to programming. Um, that we have at our meetings, and we will collate and put together tips and tricks and best practices and things that especially a lot of our more seasoned um, members have uh, have learned over their time with training grants, and we'll put those into documents that can be shared for our community, um, particularly for those that may be new to training grants, um, but all of us can, can use some tricks, tips, excuse me, some tips and tricks uh, when we're working on the training grants. Next slide. And so this is just kind of some examples of what we do. So within the community and networking space, we do have a Slack channel. It worked a lot better before they went to a model that you had to pay for. So we are currently looking for a new place for people to be able to interact and ask questions kind of immediately um, with each other. But we do have a Slack. We have a listserv for questions and for putting out information. We have community meetings three times a year after the major training grant deadlines, uh, submission deadlines. So we just had one in June. Our next one will be in October. And then we do have job posting and recruitment for those that are looking for new positions, as well as those that have positions that they would like to post. So we do that as part of our community as well. Um, we touched on this just a bit, but again, we have group source data. So one of the surveys was training grant support structures at particular uh, participating institutions. You can see how other institutions training grants, how they organize things. Do they have this? If they don't, how do they deal with the data collection? All of that is in that one report that's available for our community. We also had another popular one that was commonly used, table data collection systems, and most importantly, their pros and cons for those that are looking into new ways to collect the table data. Um, and then, of course, we always want to be up to date with what people in the community are interested in. So we survey quite regularly for topics and things that people are interested in. In fact, we've had so many topics come up at our meetings um, lately that we will probably need to start having some additional meetings or extra special meetings for topics that are of interest to a group of individuals within the community. Um, programming and best practices and collaboration. Um, we have talked about all the tables at our meeting, um, at our meetings, and we now have table best practices documents that, of course, will now be updated with the changes that we're going to talk about today. But again, that's a resource that has tips and tricks and other things for for how to put together those tables. Um, data and career outcomes tracking is another example, and we've just started talking about kind of of faculty mentor training and the best practices around that. Um, and then just a few projects when the NIH puts out RFIs or requests for information on topics that are of interest to our community, um, we will put surveys out. We will um, ask our community the answers to the questions for the RFI, collate them, and send them off to the NIH on behalf of the NTG COP. Um, I think we have a unique voice within the space because we're training granted, we're just one, we're one organization of training grant administrators. And so we did the RFI for NIGMS did on trainees, I think in 2022, um, and the postdoc uh, re-envisioning survey that came out in 2023. And I am going to pass it on to Kelly to continue with our slides and talking about the NTG COP. Thank you, Liz. Now that we've provided you a brief overview of who we are and what we do, we now want to talk about how you can connect with us. Our main platform is our website, www.ntgcop.org. Here you'll find comprehensive information about our mission, our upcoming meetings, and much more. One of the most valuable sections is our member resources area, which you'll see at the top right of our website. 
This is where all of those essential materials that Liz was talking about, such as the database systems report, the training grant office structure survey report, and our community responses to the NH NIH RFIs live. Um, additionally, you'll find the best practices for data tables, our member directory, recordings of past meetings, um, and proceedings from our various conferences that we've attended over the past couple of years. So now you may be asking, if you are not a member yet of the NTG COP, um, where can you where can you join? So simply complete the membership survey at the bottom of our website. Um, we are eager to welcome new members, and we hope to see you at our next community meeting on October 24th. Uh, your involvement really helps us continue to grow and support each other in the field of training grant administration. Next slide, please. So to illustrate the collaborative nature of our community, we have a couple of questions for you. These next two polls are going to be more open-ended, short answer polls. And so we'll, you'll see a Zoom poll now. We'll give you a couple of minutes to answer this first question, which is, what advice and suggestions do you have for PIs and administrators putting together their first training grant? Um, so just so you know, uh, we will we value your input and we will compile these collective responses into a comprehensive advice document. We will then share this resource with today's attendees and our broader NTG COP membership. And this will help provide valuable insights for these first time applicants navigating the complexities of training grant submissions. Um, and this is exactly what we do with our community in crowdsourcing information and bringing it together and sharing it through a large platform. You've already got quite a lot of responses. <laughs> Perfect. So I think in this case, um, since it's short answer, we have about 160 responses. Do we want to go to the next poll? Let's see, give it one more minute. Okay, well, sure. This way people can finish up their, their thoughts there. Sure. We'll give everyone 20 more seconds, final call to finish your sentence. Okay. All right, I think we can go ahead and, and close this one. All right, and here is our, oops, every time the poll pops up, it drops my notes. Oh no. Sorry, all technical difficulties. Well, all right. we're on our third poll. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> My notes won't come up anymore, so we're going to wing it without them. That's okay. That's what practice is for, right? So to follow up on the great responses that you gave us to the previous poll, now we want to shift direction slightly and ask you, what barriers have you encountered when completing an NIH training grant application? Uh, and what suggestions do you have for the NIH um, to help alleviate that burden? And similarly, these responses will be collected, collated, shared with today's attendees, our NTG COP membership, as well as with, with Erica and the NIH.
while we're just waiting on this, I wanted to say thank you to the person that suggested Discord instead of Slack. I, we've gone through a lot of them, but I don't think we had thought of that platform before. So thanks, thanks for that suggestion. All right, and with that, we'll give 20 more seconds or so here for you to finish out your, your thoughts on your suggestions before we, we move on. And again, a lot of responses, which is great. Okay. All right. We'll get that closed out. And then I'm going to just answer a quick question here in the chat before we move forward, um, just to, to follow up on our data table best practices and um, those being reviewed or approved by the NIH. They are not, but what we do like to, the way we look at the training grant community of practice is uh, we, we operate in the realm of advice um, and opinions. So it is crowdsourced information from from a variety of experts of trading grants across the nation. Um, so we, we operate in those in between the lines, opinions, advice that may not be able to be vetted by the NIH or, or others. Um, so they, they are not reviewed or approved by NIH, um, but they are crowdsourced answers from, from a variety of experts that work in the trading grant space. All right, next slide, please. So I want to take a moment today to share the story behind how our group came together. So like many great ideas, this one began early in the morning, specifically 7.30 a.m. on a Saturday morning, to be precise, during the double AMC uh, great annual meeting last year in downtown Atlanta. Uh, so the NTG COP hosted a breakfast table discussion focused on training grants. We, we had a variety of people there that, that morning that, that came down for the great conversation. We had some of our community members there with us. We had some, some new individuals who were learning about our community. Uh, and the conversation naturally shifted to a, a critical question of how can institutions that lack centralized or organized training grant support provide the necessary data or metrics to persuade their leadership to to enhance training grant support at their institution. And this discussion ignited a spark. Uh, we decided we needed to explore how much time does it take to assemble a training grant application and whether there is a notable difference between institutions with or without centralized training grant support. So we presented this idea at our next community meeting. Uh, Stephanie was there in attendance and she introduced us to the FDP and its mission. We saw this as an exciting opportunity for collaboration to examine the administrative burden associated with training grants, which many of us are very familiar with. Um, simultaneously, we were in discussions, the, the NTG COP, we were in discussions with, with Eric Boone about how we could assist the NIH. Uh, and these parallel conversations converged and that's how we formed the group that you see here today. All right, next slide. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for that, Kelly. And now we are going to do, these are two very quick polls. You can launch it, Sarah, because uh, before we now hand it off to uh, Erica from NIH, we want to get a sense. One, did you see NIH's webinar on June 5th that summarized all the changes for the training grant proposals taking effect on January 25th? whether you saw it live or whether you saw a recording of it. And two, how familiar are you with the changes that are taking effect in January? So I'm going to watch this one very quickly. We're, I'll let you know, Sarah, when to close it.
I think it's okay to close it now for the sake of time. Let's end the poll and let's share the results. So where we're at, um, 44% said yes, 56% said no. Um, so 10% are very familiar, but um, you could see that over 80% are somewhat familiar or not familiar at all. And I think this will be helpful for Erica as she goes through and summarizes the changes that are taking effect. So I am now going to hand it over to Erica Boone. And thank you so much. All righty. Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, fantastic. I wanted to start off by confirming that. Uh, thank you all so much for having me here today and allowing me to very briefly address some of the updates uh, to institutional training grant applications. Um, for those of you who already uh, who participated in the NIH public webinar, this will be a refresher for you. For those folks who may not have heard as much, uh, this will be our introductory conversation. I'm sure that there will be a, another opportunity uh, to participate in a webinar that will be hosted by NIH focusing on institutional training grant uh, updates. So this won't be a one and done. You'll see me again. Uh, next slide, please. So we're going to start off by briefly addressing the goals and the scope um, of the institutional training grant updates. So NIH is currently engaged in efforts to enhance research training experiences in an effort to prepare individuals for a variety of career opportunities within the biomedical research workforce. So for the next few minutes, I'll briefly discuss the recent efforts uh, to revise our research training grant applications with, uh, and the overall goal of the updates was to ease applicant burden. Um, I think that we can all safely agree that the NIH application process in general is arduous, uh, and that includes training grants. So we're going to focus on reducing applicant and reviewer burden by streamlining some of the data that's collected within the application. Uh, so that means we're going to be asking for less and being much more clear on what we actually do uh, request in applications. Um, we also want to make sure that we are supporting broader participation within the biomedical research workforce, and we'll talk about a that a little bit more in uh, my next few slides. And also encourage institutions to improve their mentoring and training environments for its trainees that it is supporting. Now, with regards to the scope of these actions, these changes uh, will be implemented for activity codes that are listed here on the slides, and you will receive these slides, um, at least I think you will, or this is being recorded, so you're going to be able to see this for yourself. Um, so the activity codes that are listed on this slide are impacted, and these are for due dates that are occur on or after January 25th of 2025. So next slide, please. So this slide gives an overview, general overview of our updates. So please keep in mind that our efforts do not, our current efforts do not involve wholesale restructuring of training grant review criteria like we're currently engaging in with our NIH fellowships. But we're engaging in more of a targeted update to allow us to further support uh, the biomedical research workforce um, and also to improve or reduce uh, barriers for applicant organizations that are attempting to complete these applications. So how are our goals listed on the previous slide being implemented? So um, we will include new language that speaks to expectations for mentor training uh, in um, uh, application instructions, uh, review criteria, et cetera. Um, we're also moving the recruitment plan to enhance diversity from being nested within the program plan uh, to its own attachment within the program plan in the PHS P, uh, 398 and moving it along with uh, uh, RCR from an additional review consideration uh, to be considered uh, as an additional review criteria. And as you know, this will impact the overall impact score. Uh, we're also promoting consistent information collection within data tables. So like I said in the previous slide, we're only asking for what is needed as a part of the review. Next slide, please. So we're going to go into some examples <laughs> of uh, some of the changes that I mentioned on the previous slides. And I can't see the chat. So if there are anything that comes up that's important, Stephanie, just let me know. Sure. 
Okay, thank you so much. So I spoke um, very briefly on the previous slide about some of the changes that are coming up in particular with the recruitment plan to enhance diversity. So this is a snapshot of the current PHS 398 research training uh, plan form. Uh, and this includes the uh, recruitment plan to enhance diversity as one of the uh, included elements or embedded elements within the program plan. So next slide, please. Thank you. So after January 25th, 2025, the recruitment plan to enhance diversity will be its own attachment. Um, it will have a, the same three page uh, limit. Uh, and the idea behind this move is in recognition that the recruitment plan, along with the RCR, are core strong training program elements. Uh, so we're gonna be treating them similarly from the standpoint of the application as well as the review. Next slide, please. All right, moving on to mentoring. Uh, so mentoring is considered to be a set of skills that a person can learn, operate, as well as strengthen over time. Formal training and ongoing professional development in effective mentoring practices has been shown to improve the knowledge and skills of research mentors across career stages, as well as improve mentee outcomes. So with that being said, what do we mean? Everyone benefits from enhanced mentor training, not just the trainee, but also the mentor themselves. So uh, supporting mentors as they grow as mentors, so whether they have been mentoring for 40 years or for four months, is really paramount to the advancement of the workforce. So in recognition of this, um, uh, mentor training language will be expanded within the training grant NOFO itself. Um, it will be addressed as a part within the program plan instructions, as well as review criteria. Um, as a note, I wanted to also mention, nope, not yet. There we go. As a note, I wanted to also mention that TRE funds can be used uh, for these purposes for mentor training. Now, next slide. Thank you so much. So under program considerations, we lay out additional considerations to support mentor training opportunities. So here in this slide are some examples um, that can be considered as potential mentor training components. Um, of course, all training should be developed to address program as well as trainee needs. I'll give you a second to take a look at the slide. I don't wanna to move too fast. All righty, next slide. Um, applicant institutions uh, should address plan strategies as well as how training may be monitored and of course should address how the strategies will meet programmatic as well as the trainee needs, okay? So it all needs to make sense in the whole grand scheme of things. Um, how will the, the training, I mean, the mentor training really impact the program administration? How will it impact the trainees? How does it impact the, uh, the, the mentor as well? And I also wanted to make note um, that we're going to be incorporating uh, uh, additional questions into review criteria to align with the train uh, the changes around mentor training language. Next slide. All righty, trainee career development and program plan. And of course, my computer is going off with alerts as well as my phone. Um, whenever I'm giving a webinar, as much as I tell my mom, I'm going to be busy, don't call me. She still does. I think she's checking in to see how things are going. Uh, <laughs> so uh, getting back to the presentation and trainee career development, um, applicant organizations should also address how they intend to embed learning opportunities for trainees to develop professional skills and networks as they are needed as they transition into careers within the biomedical research workforce. So including those careers as independent investigators, as well as those career paths that support the advancement of the biomedical research workforce or research in, in general is of paramount importance, okay? Next slide. Now let's talk data tables. We heard a little bit about data training tables from before there even groups, uh, letters that have been sent to the NIH about this and uh, groups that are organizing around these. So we wanna talk about some of our, um, our burden reduction efforts regarding our training data tables. Um, 
we just want to want you guys to have to do less work. And I know that that is something that is definitely will be beneficial to institutions across this nation. So current revisions to the NOFO and, and T32 NOFO and instructions are in an effort to reduce applicant organization burden, but also to promote consistency and the types of information that is being requested and that will be submitted by applicant organizations. So let's go through a few examples of that. So like, for example, with table one, currently T32 applicant organizations are asked to provide both pre-doc and postdoctoral uh, information regardless of the training stage within the application. So in applications post January 25 or 2025, um, applicant organizations will be asked only to provide information that's relevant to the training stage that's proposed in the application. Um, moving on to table eight. Thank you for the letter to NIH uh, regarding table eight. Um, this is exciting news, I know, for everyone, um, but currently all applicant organizations are asked to include information on clearly associated trainees. However, very few people really understood how to define clearly associated trainees. We got the message loud and clear that it was very confusing. So post January 25th of 2025, we're dropping the requirement uh, to list individuals that are clearly associated with the training grant. So we're removing part two of table eight from the application. You're welcome. Next slide, please. Thank you. So current table five. So this is a snapshot of the current table five. So within application instructions for table five, uh, NIH asks train about trainee data, like the average number of publications, the first author publications, those without publications, yada, yada, yada. Uh, the way the table is aligned also is very problematic. Um, there's misalignment between the title, um, which focuses on trainees, but the data presented is also focused on participating faculty. Uh, applicant organizations are often confused about which trainees to include and more. So in response to that, next slide, please. Thank you. We want to refocus uh, uh, the, the table five to focus on the trainee outcomes that are more in line with the fellowships and career development award applications. So the table will also allow for inclusion of interim research projects and for uh, to, in, to uh, include information from undergraduates like published abstracts. So we want to realign the table focus to really kind of focus on the trainees and their outcomes. Next slide, please. So with that in mind, this is a snapshot of what table five will actually look like. Um, so we're gonna be refocusing and realigning it. So you see the trainee na uh, name uh, on the very left-hand side, uh, it's gonna be matched with the mentors. And then you can include uh, different uh, uh, outcome information for the pre-doc or for post-docs. Next slide, please. Table six. Currently, T32 applicant organizations report detailed information on all individuals that apply to and enter training programs, along with trainee characteristics such as mean prior months. Oops. Nope. Go back. There we go. Stop. Right there. <laughs> um, Sorry. No, no problem at all. I mean, what's a webinar without a technical issue or two, huh? Uh, so as I was saying, uh, for table six, you're asked to um, provide detailed characteristics on all applicants and entrance into a program, like prior months of training, uh, full-time research uh, experience, prior institutions, uh, percentage of individuals from uh, URM groups, as well as the GPA. So next slide. There we go. So this is an example of what the new table six will look like, where we're stripping out or not asking anymore about these specific trainee characteristics like prior experience, like GPA, like institutions, all of that information will be removed. And we're hoping that this particular table um, will feel like it's much more streamlined with the information uh, that is being requested from institutions. Next slide, please. Alrighty, I am wrapping up and we're going to move on to peer review updates. So I want to reiterate that training grants will retain the current uh, the current five score review criteria. And this effort is not holistically revising the review criteria um, like we're doing with the NIH fellowships. 
Um, I also want to reiterate that uh, some of the biggest review uh, criteria updates is that the recruitment plan to enhance diversity and RCR now are uh, will be considered rather will be considered additional review criteria as opposed to additional review considerations. And with this change, both of these items will be considered at the level of overall impact. Next slide, please. The changes that I have briefly summarized will be applicable for applications with due dates on or after January 25th of 2025, and it will be applicable for the activity codes that are listed on this slide. Next slide, please. Implementation timeframe. So um, because we understand that there's a lot of effort that goes into um, assembling a T32 application, we want to make sure that the parent T32 NOFOs are available and are published at the latest in late October so that in applicant organizations have um, sufficient time to be able to see the specific changes and, or, and also to be able to address those within their T32 application. Next slide, please. So who should you contact at NIH with questions? So the first point of contact should be those individuals at your institution. So your central offices of sponsor programs should be your first stop. Your next stop is your NIH grants management specialist or officer that is indicated on your notice of award. Um, that individual uh, from the grants management or your grants management specialist will then reach out to the appropriate NIH entity, whether that is the Office of Policy uh, for Extramural Research Administration or OPERA, or whether it would be us here at DBRW. Next slide, please. If you want to find out and keep up with all of the exciting uh, activities or initiatives around fellowships and training grants here at the NIH, we do have public pages that list updates for both of these efforts uh, on our website. So if you go to the uh, grants.nih.gov website and you search for updates to fellowships or institutional training grants, you will be able to find uh, resources that are specific to both of these initiatives. Next slide, please. Um, I previously mentioned this before, as well as it was mentioned very earlier, um, much earlier in the webinar, that there are several initiatives that are ongoing here at the NIH to help us to improve research training opportunities um, across for, for in individuals that are interested in pursuing career opportunities within the biomedical research workforce. Uh, on the left, uh, you'll see the link and the uh, snapshot of the website for updates to the NRSA uh, fellowship applications. And then on the right, NIH, I think it was just last Thursday, we released a follow-up RFI um, to the recommendations on re-envisioning U.S. postdoctoral research training and career uh, progression. So basically, we have a second RFI that's focusing on postdocs. Do us a favor, do the workforce a favor, please submit your comments. Um, and that is all for me. I think that we're gonna go into the Q&A. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you, Dr. Boone, for a wonderful presentation, uh, providing significant uh, insight into um, where we are currently with training grants. And thank you, Liz and Kelly as well, for, for telling people that there is a community of practice and a group that they can become part of. All right, so a couple questions um, and we'll go fast looking at time. Um, how, how is the NIH measuring the outcomes and impact of training grants? And, and what is the outlook for uh, NIH support uh, going forward? Um, so the, of course, we all know that the goal for the training grant uh, is to enable institutions to support pre and postdocs um, with training opportunities to prepare them for careers that are focusing on advancing biomedical research and meeting the needs of um, this nation. So, but when, when considering trainee success, um, I think that we're all aware that it's not solely a matter anymore of how many individuals move on to receive an R01, um, but we're looking for broader impacts of the programs themselves um, and the impacts on the trainees. So are you making attempts to recruit widely? That is the programs for your programs. Um, are trainees completing coursework? Are they moving through the program in a timely manner? Are they graduating? Are they moving on to the next phases of their career? And what are these positions? Um, also, are trainees conducting and publishing their research? 
Are they incorporating new skills? Are they getting grant writing experience? Are they writing grants? Are they teaching, serving as mentors? Are they uh, moving on into areas to advance the biomedical research workforce that are beyond the bench? Because we know that careers in biomedical research in general, you just don't live you know, from the bench. There's so many other training and professional development opportunity or training and development um, uh, skills that are needed in order to do this. Um, also, one of the things that I wanted to point out is that our others uh, in training at your institution that are not necessarily participants in your T32 or your T34 also benefiting from that training grant being at your institution. So really, um, we want more information about how your programs are really benefiting biomedical research, um, the workforce, and what's innovative about them. No, absolutely. Yeah, using the funds to make a difference is absolutely right. So yeah. thank you for that. All right, uh, Steph, did you want to ask the next question? Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, I just want to say that there were a lot of excited people in the chat. They're like, yay, they're very excited to see these changes in the data tables. And I'm also happy to report that the Q&A coming in is very consistent with the same questions that we received ahead of time. So I I can rest assured this these are the questions that are in everyone's mind. I want to throw this to uh, the NDG Top, you mentioned that you've been helpful in soliciting feedback on RFIs. Um, oh, actually, you did address this earlier. Um, how, with these new changes coming, um, how can the NDG COP assist the community for the upcoming changes? Yeah, I can go ahead and start, and then Kelly, please chime in as I'm going. Um, so, as we we will be having these as the different changes as topics um, at our next meetings. And at that time, we kind of talk about like how people are going to address them, what they're thinking about, maybe share best practices from everybody's institute to discuss. And then we'll share that out with the community for everybody to use. So it will be, it'll also be a place for people to ask questions. So I was thinking this way, what does everybody else think? So we'll be able to have a dialogue around the changes kind of as they're going. And then we'll also update any of our best practices such as this going forward. And Kelly, did I miss anything? The only other point that I'll add there is that our goal as a community is to help people be ahead of the curve on these changes, right? As NIH are re is releasing these updates, we want to come together as a community and talk to help people prepare in advance rather than be behind the curve trying to, you know, scurry and, and prepare their institution for these changes. So we're really just about capacity building and and honestly sitting down and talking through some of these changes and be like, how are you approaching this? So, so I'm cognizant of time. Uh, we have a, a set of questions that um, were provided before, but I just to be re respectful of time, we should probably not go into the next set of seven, eight, nine, ten questions that we have <laughs> uh, uh, already asked from the group. And so, uh, Stephanie, do you want to do you want to close us out or should we keep answering questions? Um, we because we're three fifty nine, I'm guessing that we want to close them out unless, Erica, you want to address anything else that you see uh, in the chat or in the questions that we received ahead of time. Otherwise, I, I'll do I've the last a, poll. I've got a couple more minutes. Um, yeah. Okay. No, that's great. Um, Robert, how about we go to question number nine? Because I know it's it's been on people's minds and yeah. we just received it as well. So I think it's so a good this one. Is, yeah, so this is about a recruitment plan to enhance diversity. And I, I saw a couple of questions out there. So several states have enacted and proposed anti-DEI laws. And really the group is asking for you to share um, from the NIH perspective, um, what what should uh, applicants do to address uh, the diversity plans in the NIH proposals, um, especially in the face of state laws that might prevent um, uh, some of the words for which that some people might want to use? So let me tell you, if I had a nickel for every time I've been asked this question in the last six months, I'd have a whole lot of nickels. And I definitely understand that there are policy and there are legal issues here 
you know, that seem to be, you know, at odds. But I, I want to definitely start off by saying that if an applicant organization has any questions about the legality of any parts of their application uh, or application administration, not just um, the recruitment plan to enhance diversity, we really recommend that you reach out first to your institutional office of general counsel, your legal counsel to understand your laws in your state. Um, once an applicant organization has a bit more clarity and if there are additional questions about the application process, then please do reach out to us here at the NIH. NIH can't confirm your eligibility or tell you what is or what is not lawful in your particular state. Um, in the end, uh, applicant organizations are responsible for following all applicable state laws and organizational policies. So starting at home would be my first recommendation. Also, I want to point out, because our own OGC has told me, make sure that you say this, that consistent with federal law, um, NIH does not consider race. We don't consider ethnicity or sex, including gender identity, sexual orientation, or transgender status of an individual researcher, trainee, or personnel involved with a, re a proposed research project as a means to restrict eligibility or selection criteria. Nor do we consider these factors when reviewing or scoring an application to make funding decisions. A lot of stuff that I was told to make sure that I say. Now, in reference to the recruitment plan, from my understanding, recruitment and admission are two distinct processes, right? And while targeted college admissions are not allowable, from my understanding, target recruitment is allowable. Now, let me tell you what I mean by recruitment. Recruitment, as used in the context for the recruitment plan, refers to targeted recruitment and outreach efforts to encourage individuals to apply to the program. It does not refer to hiring. It does not um, apply to appointing someone specifically. So with this in mind, we at NIH recognize the scientific and societal benefits of broad diversity within the biomedical research um, and its workforce. The recruitment plan doesn't represent an attempt by NIH to mandate that research organizations require percentages of individuals from underrepresented groups to participate in research. It really provides an opportunity for applicant organizations and funded organizations to discuss their outreach strategies and their activities designed to recruit potential training grant candidates, um, including those from diverse backgrounds, like, for example, those that are underrepresented within under, underrepresented racial and ethnic groups, those individuals with disabilities, those individuals from disadvantaged backgrounds, right? Um, I also wanted to make mention that the notice of interest in diversity is not a list of eligibility criteria. So please don't move forward it, one more day thinking that that's how we define eligibility because it's not. Um, so what are the types of activities that could be permissible to promote broad participation within the biomedical research workforce? So let me give you a few examples. Um, let's just say outreach activities to foster awareness of research training opportunities for potential trainees. Um, targeted recruitment activities to diversify um, applicant pools, like, for example, recruitment engagements and partnerships with different types of institutions or organizations. Let's just say undergraduate-focused institutions, HBCUs, emerging research institutions, uh, community-based organizations. Um, also, we're talking about targeted recruitment activities intended for individuals with disabilities. Um, let's just say efforts to strengthen faculty mentoring and plans to provide structured mentoring programs as well. Um, expanding mentoring, networking, and skills development opportunities, engaging in summer research opportunities to expand your research and your network collaborations, uh, leveraging your internal institutional strengths, your campus student offices, uh, interest groups, your affinity groups, your local chapters of um, professional organizations. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. It's really an opportunity for an institution to talk about its plans, right? Um, and let's just say, Let's, let's just say that I always get the question of, well, what if we don't achieve what our goal is in the application? One, I hope you're not talking about numbers of people, but it's just like any other research application. 
if you don't achieve a particular goal stated in your application, you just don't throw that out. You just don't, you know, start over again. You revise and you resubmit, right? You look at what happened. You, you look at what your plans were. You revise your plans in an effort to be able to improve that process over and over and over again. So um, it's really in a looking at your plans, right? Looking at how you're trying to achieve that plan as opposed to we got two people, we got three people. What, what was your plan to enhance opportunities and to expand opportunities for participation within the biomedical research workforce? Long answer, but I had a lot of stuff that I had to say and a lot of stuff that I want to say and the examples too, because I think that here at NIH, we focus so much on what you cannot do and what you should not do. But what I don't think that we do enough of is tell you what you can't do. And that's Thanks. why we're grateful for you, Dr. Boone. And I'm so grateful for the answer and that you took the time out to um, really address it. So thank you so much. And, you know, I want to close it out since we're at 406. And thank you for everybody, all the attendees who stayed on uh, for an extra six minutes. How I would like to close this out. Sarah, can you launch the final poll? Ooh, another poll. <laughs> okay. So um, the whole purpose of today is to talk about how the FDP, the NTG, COP, and NIH can work together to evaluate the effectiveness of these proposal changes taking effect in January. And so it's kind of like, where do we go from here? What are our next steps? This was the very first step in just starting the conversation and really have how, and I'm hoping that participants have a better understanding also about the missions of the FDP and the NGCOP and what we can do to keep the conversation going, help us prioritize what we should do next. For example, should we have ongoing listening sessions? Should we be doing a study, a white paper? Um, should we be examining extract more? Or maybe you have some other suggestions in the community. Um, and we are gonna collect these. We're gonna share the results with Erica. We're gonna share the results with you. Um, and we're also going to include it in a post webinar survey. So if um, you know, you, you, you're still thinking about your answer, you'll still have an opportunity to ask this question. So we're just going to give it another minute. Um, I want to thank you, Erica, for taking the time to be such a wonderful panelist. I want to thank you, Kelly and Liz. We've worked together to make this happen. <laughs> We've been talking about it for months and we finally did it. Um, and I'm really just excited First of all, I'm really excited from an FDP perspective because we look at administrative burden. I'm so excited with all the table changes that you listed. It's really, <laughs> people are really excited about it. Oops, sorry, you're muted. I try to mute myself so that I don't interject. Um, but this is not the, the a one and done. We're going to have more opportunities for engagement. I'm going to be a great grand in October, so we'll have an opportunity to talk then. Um, but we are thankful to receive additional information and guidance because we want to make sure that we're improving um, our processes internally so that we don't create unintended barriers. Thank you. I'm going to end the poll here because I think people stopped responding. Great. And oh, um, I could share the results. I actually could share the results of this one now just to get a snapshot. Oh, oh can you see it? Oops, there we go. So they want us to keep talking, right? <laughs> keep keep the lines of communication open, followed by they would love to see some type of formal study or survey to evaluate uh, the work that goes into preparing these types of training grants. And there's definitely a lot of interest in testing extract. And that's one of the great things about FDP is you can think of us as a test bed, a test bed where you could come to us and our members anytime you want to try something out or test something out like an electronic system. So we'd be happy to coordinate those activities. All right. I think the last thing that oh, we should sure. say, Stephanie, is is where should people send questions to um, afterwards? I know we gave a number of email addresses. Um, I, what would we recommend for the unanswered questions of the group? What would we recommend for the unanswered question for the group? Um, Sarah, maybe we should put in the chat. Should we use the overall FDP email box? Um, I would 
here you, they can send it to me and then i can compile it and forward to the group. that would be great can you throw your email in the chat it's, yes yeah sir. it's it's her name up above s peter zach yeah oops i was sharing it just to one person so let me share it to everybody yeah, sure. so please send your emails to Sarah. Uh, she'll compile them. We'll answer more, and then we'll distribute back um, to our community. Absolutely. And we are absolutely going to share the slides, the recording. It's going to be on our website, thefdp.org. If you go to meetings and listening sessions, it will be under a past session. And so we'll post everything there. Thank you so much for attending. Uh, we're going to end the meeting now. I'm going to ask my panelists to just stay on for just a couple of minutes. Um, and Sarah, if you have a way to Thank end the all. meeting for the other folks, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Oh, and stop the recording. I could do that.